Dealing with mental challenges of running a business is critical to your success and your happiness, yet overwhelm, stress and anxiety are the biggest challenges for many trade business owners. Tune into today's podcast where I interview Richard Petrie, who's an international sportsman, mental skills coach and expert business coach uh, for architects about a very powerful tool for dealing with stress and for making yourself more successful. You don't want to miss this one. Alrighty team, uh, g'day to everyone. Tony Fraser-Jones here, the host of the Profitable Trading Podcast. Uh, I've ditched my co-host uh, and uh, some would say better half, Phil Smith, today and upgraded uh, to be talking with uh, with Richard Petrie. Now, Richard has presented to our uh, coaching group on several occasions and has been a huge favorite. His insights and tools around how to improve uh, your mental game are massively valuable. So, Richard, welcome, mate. Awesome to be hanging out today. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Tony. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I love what you do. I get your emails and stuff like that. And uh uh, and rip some of it off. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, just quietly, uh, that might go both ways. <laughs> right. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Quite right. Nothing yeah. like a, a, mutu a mutual admiration society, mate. I can remember um, watching you play cricket for New Zealand. Actually, uh, just for like for you Aussies and Kiwis listening, you'll understand if you're in uh, the US or maybe Canada, you're like, what is this bloody cricket game? Uh, it's a great game. Just go with it. Um, you know, if you haven't uh, learnt the joys of it yet, you will. But I can remember watching you play cricket against uh, Australia, and um, being super competitive and and getting into the uh, getting into the Aussies right from the get go. You just sort of never took a backward step. So um, I think it was it Alan Bordy had a go at a few times, was it? Well, once, uh, yeah, oh. once, uh, yeah. The first first ball I bowled to him. So the problem I had was I'd kind of come from nothing and. You know, I'd come from club cricket, really. And uh, you're walking out playing against these guys that you've only seen on TV and you are a bit starstruck by it. And you have to keep reminding yourself, stop stop um, staring at them, uh, these guys. Because a new batsman, oh, here's Dean Jones, here's Steve Waugh, here's Alan Border. And so then I bowled, I bowled the first ball to Alan Border. And, you know, I thought, I thought to myself, where the hell do I bowl to Alan Border? You know, I've only ever seen him smash everybody around and he's, he's one of the great players. So I thought, I've got no idea. I'm just going to bowl it. So I just bowled it. And um, it was cross seam as well. So it wasn't even seam up. And it beat him outside the off stump for some reason. I don't know why. And then I, I kind of felt duty. I thought, I've just beaten him. I should say something now. You know, I can't just turn around and walk back. So, but I didn't know what to say. So I stood there looking at him. And I, I think I just, you know, I just yelled out the F word at him. And then I thought, I, I can't really think of anything else to say because I really wasn't expecting to, to bowl a ball that, you know, that it was really good. So then I just had to turn around and walk back. So that was, that was my extent of my abuse to Alan Border. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was, uh, he was probably laughing because, you know, you'd ask for all their autographs before you bowled. Um, yeah, well, that's, that, right. that's all good. <laughs> um, sure. Mate, look, really appreciate taking some time today. Um, I thought maybe we'd kick off with um, just a bit of background about yourself would be would be awesome. So the listeners know a little bit about you know your background before we jump into the uh, into the meat and drink. What we're going to do today, which is a, a incredibly useful tool, which I think everyone's just going to love. Yep. So uh, brief okay. history of, uh, of of Richard. Well, I'll give you the relevant bit that might sort of apply to this. But when I was about probably twenty nineteen twenty. Um, I wasn't doing any business. I was just trying to play cricket. I was just trying to, you know, I did, my dream would be to get in the Canterbury cricket team. And I was driving my mother's car, listening to the radio and Jeff Howarth, who was the New Zealand captain at the time, this is how long ago it was, you know, he was asked the question, what, um, what's the difference between a first class player and an international player? And my ears immediately pricked up because I thought, actually, I want to know this. This is a really good question. And he said, is it, you know, are they, are they better? Are they fitter? Are they, he, Jeff Howe said, no, not really. He said, the only real difference between a first class player and an international player is the top two inches. He said, it's really just the way they think. And that was a real light bulb moment for me because I thought, you know, because you're always, you know, when you're young and desperate and hungry and trying to be successful, whether it's business or anything else, you're always looking for what's the thing. And, and as soon as he said that, I kind of thought that's it, you know, that is the thing because I was, I had this, you know, enough skills and I had enough, you know, I was doing the training, I was doing everything, but I thought if I can be, and he said it's 80% 80 mental. 
And, and I'd, I'd say to, you know, you got tradies here and all that type of stuff. And, you know, same question. What's the difference between a highly profitable tradie, you know, highly successful one and just an average one? And, you know, there, there's certain tools and skills you need, obviously. But once you've got that, there's a lot of people who have that. And I think whether it's in business or whether it's in sport or, or, or anything, you know, as a singer or a, anything, it's, it, it often comes down to the top two inches. And he said it's 80% mental. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I went off to my coach and um, said, right, you know, hey, I want to get better. Um, what are we going to do at training tonight? Oh, I said, I said, you know, what percentage of success comes down to mindset? And he said, oh, it's 80% mental. And he said, oh, I said, funny you say that because that's what Jeff Howe said on the radio, 80% mental. And I, I kind of agree, you know, I mean, obviously you have to, you have to have the fitness, you have to have that stuff in place, but a lot of people have that. So once you've got that, it's 80% mental. And I said, what are we going to do at training tonight? And he said, oh, well, you know, you'll, you'll bowl the nets for an hour and then we'll do some fielding and then you, we'll run around the park for half an hour. I said, all right, well, that covers the 20%. When are we going to work on this 80% that you said was the most important? And then he just brushed me off like, you know, cheeky little shit. And, but actually it was a really good point because it's what we did and it's what a lot of people do is they focus on the 20%, the mechanics. And I know that you, you know, you, you talk a lot about mindset stuff, Tony, and you may or may not do it in a formal manner. I think you do do some of it in a formal manner, but that stuff is as important. Yes, there's the techniques and you need those and you've got those, but there's also the mindset stuff, which I think people probably don't realize when they're on a program like yours or mine or something like that, that it's the mindset stuff which is just as important because just having the tools is not enough. You know, I see a lot of people coming to our programs and they all get different results and it's largely down, they all get given the same tools, but they get different results. And it's largely down to how much of this mindset stuff they take on. So anyway, coming back to this long, uh, long story, I'm going to say to make a long story short, but it's too late to say yeah. Make yeah, it that's a long story, slightly shorter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just to bring it to a conclusion. So that's why I got interested in the mental side. And I started doing it for myself. I started, you know, learning visualization and learning different mental tools. And I went quickly from club cricketer who couldn't get in anything to within probably two years, I was playing international cricket. And it was largely, not everything, but it was largely because mentally I'd made myself quite good. I taught myself different ways of thinking and it, it made that much difference. And the interesting thing I found is that when I was at the international level, the guys were all thinking about how they were thinking. Whereas at the club level, no one was thinking about how they were thinking about their grip on the bat and their tech and all that. But at international level, no, it, they were reading books on the subconscious mind and they were, they were doing all the stuff that I'd kind of done. So it was really interesting. The top performers intuitively know this and the guys at club level don't think that, that much about it. But it's the same in business too. I, I find the, the high performers kind of think about how they think and that they, they invest in themselves and that's a lot of your guys, that's why they're on, guys and ladies, that's why they're on this your program and because they're thinking about how they think and they're, they're investing in their mind. Um, and the average performers, the club performers don't. And so, as a, yeah, it is important to think about how you think and it does make a big difference. It's massive. It's, um, it's almost being conscious of your thinking. It's almost stepping outside the box. And I think probably the, the thing that I see with, uh, with our members and, my very limited sporting career, uh, very limited, uh, and, and is it's about how they deal with the fear and the uh, uncertainty and the lack of confidence that comes from that, which then causes them to be tentative, yep. and and they just can't express themselves and 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 you know perform to their full potential. That's that's cricket, sport, any sport. It's the same in business, and it manifests in a lack of implementation, uh, and 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 just stuff doesn't happen because people are either overthinking it or scared of the outcome or what if they fail or what if they succeed? I mean, it's all of those things. It's all kind of, there's a big fear underneath all of it. Exactly. And that tool that we're going to talk about today will help with that. It'll help make everything simple. There's just three boxes we're going to put everything into. And once you know which box to put it in, you'll know how to deal with it 
and when you know how to, yeah, it just, it'll, it, it'll make things a lot simpler for people. Yeah, let's, let's, let's jump into it. So um, I'm really excited about this. So uh, what we're talking about is, is the traffic lights. Uh, so probably best way is for maybe you jump in and, and talk us through how this works and how you apply it, and then we can tease out the bits from there. There's a whole lot of stuff that we can be thinking about, right? Uh, inflation, uh, global warming, um, viruses, uh, world hunger, the economy, um, your own health, Jacinda, uh, if you're in New Zealand. <laughs> let's, let's, not, let's not go there, mate. This is like a family show. Family show, right. Uh, it's funny that all the, you know, we're in New Zealand. I know not all your people in New Zealand, but uh, it's funny that um, business owners tend to think a certain way when it comes to uh, what's happening in New Zealand. Anyway, we're, and we're all in the green. <laughs> it's almost like we're all in alignment. Moving on. Kind of, but anyway, right, health, uh, work, your workload. All right, there's a million things that can overwhelm you. Now, so that there's this thinking pattern which is, if you think of three, three different, if you think of three columns, there's the green zone, there's the orange zone, and the red zone. Okay, so all, all stuff can be put in one of those three buckets. Okay, so let's start with the green zone. Right, the green zone is about what is the process? What is my next step? Um, it's, and, and the green zone can be, I, can be categorized as everything that you can 100% control. Okay, everything you can 100% control. And I'm gonna come back to this in a minute. Because uh, it's not a lot. Right, so that's the green zone. Orange zone is kind of, so green is go, right? Orange is warning, right? You get the lights or amber in some countries or yellow. Um, amber is warning. Amber is what you can influence, but you can't control it. Okay, you can influence, but can't control it. And I'll give you examples of all of them in a minute. I might jump in with a little one right now. I have teenage children. I, yours are slightly older. You must have started a lot younger than me, mate. Uh, yeah, you can influence them, but you cannot control them. Correct. That's a perfect example, right? Kids, other people is a good, well, let's, let's go through some of them. So I'll come back to green in a minute, but let's yeah. give, let me give you some examples of orange. You can't control staff. You can influence them to a degree, but you can't control them. Uh, suppliers, you can influence them. Once again, you can withhold payments or you can yell at them or you can, whatever, but you can't control them. Family, uh, clients, right? They're in the orange zone. Your sales are in the orange zone. You can, sales are, 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 are an outcome from the, the inputs. So green zone is inputs. Orange is like the outcomes that you get from doing the, the inputs. So sales and profits are orange zone. They are outcomes. Now, in a sporting context, you know, um, orange zone would be the score. It would be whether you get selected for a team or not. It would be whether you win or lose, right? All that winning or losing sales, profits. Now it's very, the thing about the orange zone is it's very seductive. Mm. It, it, it grabs attention like nothing else. You know, we, if we're talking sporting, we want to talk about whether we're going to win or lose. We want to talk about our chances. We want to talk about the other, you know, all the, um, very seductive. It's very exciting to talk about outcomes, right? And, and it pulls your focus to outcomes and you become outcome focused. And, and particularly in sport, I kind of created this term, which I think is a really good term for explaining um, and, and works in business too. But someone who talks too much about the outcome when they should be focusing on the inputs, you know, I would call it resulting. So I remember going to Holland and I was a professional for one of the clubs over there and all the other pros warned me. They said, look, when you go to Holland, um, if you win games, you're a good, you're a good pro. If, if your team loses, you're a bad pro. It doesn't matter how many runs or wickets you take, you're only a good pro if the team is winning, right? And so very much resulting, you know, you're guilty of resulting. Look, the, the, you know, the New Zealand woman just won the Rugby World Cup by, you know, an inch. Um, everyone's happy. 
It's all outcome focus. You know, if they'd lost by two points, completely different. The public are guilty massively of resulting. The media are focused on resulting. Um, oh, yeah. and, most, and most people are focused on resulting because it's exciting, it's emotional, it's entertaining. It's where we kind of want to go, but it's not the secret to success. In fact, it's a big trap. It's, it's seductive and it's dangerous. It's important to a degree. Okay, the third area, so we've got green zone, which is you can 100% control. You've got orange zone, which you can influence, but you can't control. And then the final zone is red zone. Red zone, you can't control and you can't influence, right? So new taxes coming in, uh, Donald Trump getting elected or re-elected, um, you know, uh, COVID-19, nothing you can do about it, right? Interest rates going up, uh, inflation, uh, competition, you can influence them, you can control them. Okay, now here's the danger of red and orange. If you spend the wrong amount of time on red and orange thinking, you'll end up getting stressed. And one of the reasons you'll be stressed is you're focusing on an area that you can't control. And, and you kind of know that with red, I know I can't control inflation, but you still waste your time getting stressed and whinging about it and talking about interest rates and the government and all this type of stuff. You still waste your, waste your time on it. The more dangerous place is, is the orange zone where we think we can, we, we delude ourselves that we can control it. And when, when results don't go our way, when sales don't go quite the way we wanted and uh, winning games don't go quite the way we wanted, we get all stressed out. We start blaming everybody because we think that we can 100% control it when you can't. The orange zone, uh, you talked about it, where you feel stressed. And I thought we might just tease that out a bit more because I think so many people in business and sport yep. uh, underperform because they do spend so much time there, which basically you know, leaves them stressed, leaves them feeling out of control yes. uh, because they're you know, by definition trying to control something that they can only influence, not control. Correct. And if anyone's tried to control their teenage children, they'll know what I mean. Uh, and mine are pretty good. So if they're completely off the rails, it'll be a nightmare. Uh, yes. But what happens is it's life is an energy game and it's a focus game. And so if you're spending this energy trying to control things that you can't, you use up all this emotional energy Yep. Uh, and you start getting stressed about being stressed, and it's like this, it just leads to poor performance yes. at the end of the day, and unhappiness, right? Yep, and and, and wasted energy, yeah. yeah. And and the, the big seductive thing with the orange zone is that sometimes when you do certain things, you do get those results, and then you say to yourself, right, I can, I can win, I can get these sales, but the reasons you're getting those results is because you're doing the green zone yep. stuff right, right? Yep. So you can't just demand more sales, demand more profit, or demand teams. Bad coaches just go, you know, you've got to win. You've got to go out there. It's a case of who wants it more, you know? Come on, and it's just, just win, right? Bad coaching. Right, so let's go back to green. To the green zone. Green is the secret to it all. Green zone is, is actually quite boring, right? This is, this is the thing, it's quite boring. It's the process. It's following Tony's nine steps, you know? Um, I'm not saying yours is boring, but the process is not exciting as is, is making an extra $100,000 in sales. That's the exciting bit, but the process is what's required. So the green zone is boring. And if you listen to um, sports people talk, good sports people, now I know the All Blacks are, an example we're familiar with in different countries, you'll, you'll hear your own sportsman saying thing. But when you do an interview with the All Black captain, they are the most boring interviews you'll ever hear. It's boring stuff. The, the top players, you know, when they're talking green zone, and when they're talking green zone, they're actually giving you an insight into how they're really thinking. The ones who get all hypey and talk about that, that's not how they're really thinking when they're in the battle there. A, a good story on the green zone is um, you know one of our top players is a guy, was a guy called Richie McCaw. And it, this, this applies to any sport. So it could be Wayne Gretzky or, you know. Oh, in fact, that's a good, that's a good analogy as well, uh, Wayne Gretzky. So they said, what makes you, what's the difference between an average you know, ice hockey player and you? And he said, well, 
he said, I think I focus differently. He said, um, oh, he said two things. He said, one, most people, you know, I, 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 I skate to where the puck's going. But he said, if, if you... If you if you ask a fifty you know goal a season guy what he focuses on, he said he would be able to tell you the exact make of the goalkeeper's pads, and he'd tell you the brand and where all the he'd know every detail about that goalie because he looked at him so closely. He said, "I don't see any of that. All I see is the net." Uh. Right. So slightly different focus. Now, now the Richie McCaw version, which is the New Zealand All Black captain. <laughs> he was asked on a radio show. He said a lot of people. This kid rang him up and uh, and said, "Oh, I'm a number seven, just like you." And and a lot of people tell me I've got to focus. And and he said, "I don't really know what I should be focused on. What do you focus on as a number seven? And this is a real insight to exactly the green zone. And Richie McCaw said, "Oh well," he said, "Oh, I, I kind of like to keep it really simple." He said, if we haven't got the ball, all I think about is how can I get the ball? And if we have got the ball, what I think about is how can I get the ball up the field? And he said, that's, that's all I read. That's it. That's it. Right? So, this, and like, that's not an exciting answer to, to most people listening, but it's a true answer, right? When you're, you know, when you're that much in the battle, you have to be very focused. So, to summarize the green zone, it's a bit boring. It's what winners focus on a lot of the time when they're in the performance phase of whatever it is they're doing. And all it is, is to, there's, it's not many things because there's very little that we can 100% control, right? Very little. Um, I've broken it down to two things that I think. I can only really control what I think. That's it. And what I do. That's it. Yeah. Now, what I think and what I do is not a lot. You know, I'm just one person, but it's enough, right? It's enough. And it's enough for you in your business. If you just focused, you know, green zone, what can I, what, what should I be thinking? How should I be thinking? And what can I do? And if you just focus on, the key things you should be thinking that are going to make you a top performer, and you might have to analyze this in advance, and the key things you should be doing, and that's and, and, and success or failure for you, if you're green zoning, is how well have I done that thinking and that doing based on what I said was, you know, if I did these things, I'd be successful. And you, you, you judge success or failure on your ability to implement what you think and what you do on a daily basis. Yeah, it's, it's killer. Uh, an example that often comes up, uh, you know, when we're doing work and probably, you know, similar thing, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, your, with the architects you help, um, we have a lot of challenges for our guys when they're looking to hire people and someone leaves their business, you know, hands in their resignation and they're like, you know, it's like a punch to the stomach and they're, all frustrated and uh, thinking about, oh, how am I going to get the work done? And you now profit's going to drop and how ungrateful is this person? And life's not fair and yada, yada, yada. And it goes on. Uh, that's sort of orange zone or even red zone thinking. It's focusing on a bunch of stuff you can't control. But to focus on the green zone in that situation is to do a couple of things. Number one, it's just to look at your mind and say, well, actually there are good people out there and I'm going to find them. And two is what's the first thing I can do today to actually start that process, which might be write a job ad, or it might be post a job ad on an online directory. And that's all I do. Yeah. And, and the thing about that, like you said, it's really boring, but it does two things. Number one, it means you're taking action, which can generate a result, which can then influence the stuff in the orange zone. Well, that's all you can do. And number two, it just makes you feel a whole lot better about yourself. Yeah. Which is, it's like the double win. That's um, it. Or you yeah. could even be thinking, well, for every staff member, what's my little plan if any of them leave? And you might already have a pre-built yep. contingency and that would be cool too. So that someone leaves and you go, bugger, that's annoying, but I already have, because it, it, it's kind of easier to come up with a good plan when you're not stressed and pissed off. That's the time yep. to come up with a little contingency plan. So you go, all right, I got my folder. What was I going to do if Dave left? I was going to do boom, boom. Oh, that's right. Yeah, there are a few people. There are a few contacts. I've got a few networks. I'll get on the phone and call these guys because they they might. Know. I've already got my action plan. 
that I can execute, even though I'm a little bit pissed off, um, at least I've got a bloody good ex- action plan. Yeah. And it's okay to be frustrated for a little while, but not too long. That's right. You can wallow in a sea of self-pity, but for about five minutes, then you've got to move right. on. And you um, might learn something from it too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with someone, someone will leave. So what can I, what, what should I be thinking? Well, I might be thinking, what can I learn from this? What, what was it me or was it him? Am I providing the right environment? You know, so you can change the environment moving forward. Maybe you can go back to that person and say, Hey, you know, on, under what circumstances would you stay? And, and they might give you some answers and you can work out whether you want to, you know, there's a number of things you could do. Yeah, hundred percent. So just to sort of tie it together with the green zone, when yeah. you focus on the green zone, both for sports people, yeah. um, I mean, it applies to everything, right? It applies to your relationships with your significant others. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, if, if you often you have to do, have to give what you want in a relationship, which, which is kind of green zone thinking rather than complaining about what you're not getting. Yes. Um, so when you focus on the green zone, how does that actually help you uh, get a better result? Well, the green zone, the green zone is just what you're going to do, the inputs. So how do the inputs, you know, you've got to know in advance though, what are the high performance inputs, right? You can't, it's hard when you're just sitting there going, oh, I'm going to think green zone. No, no, no. If I'm a cricketer, let me give you a sporting example. It's probably easiest for me. If I'm a bowler, and I go, right, what's the green zone inputs? Okay, well, I know the outcome I want. I want to take lots of wickets and, and, and be very successful as a, as a bowler or a pitcher. Um, okay, I've got to work out what's the one or two things that I need to be focusing and doing that are the inputs that lead me to getting good outcomes. So in my case, it doesn't really matter what the sport is, but for the sport of cricket of bowling, the number one thing, when you there's a million things I could focus on, but most top bowlers will agree there's only a couple that make a difference. They are the things that trigger everything else off. So rhythm is one. If I make sure I find a good rhythm, it's almost like everything else clicks if, if a bowler's got good rhythm. So my focus can be rhythm would be one right? My goal is to find a rhythm as quickly as possible and focus on that rhythm and feel the rhythm. If, I, if, I, if I'm doing that, my second one might be what's my game plan. So depending on who I'm focused on, what, what line do I want to bowl? And, and often it's off stump, but you know, it, it, that might vary. So I've got to have a game plan. I've got to have a rhythm. Uh, and that's about it. If I've got those two things, that's about 90%. So I don't need to think of a hundred things. I just need to think of my line and my rhythm. And, and it makes it very simple. It makes it very boring for most people. But if I've got that rhythm, I mean, the rhythm more than the line, even. If I've just got the rhythm, everything else falls into the place. Now, if I was selling, let me put this into a selling context. You know, what's the, what's the rhythm equivalent of selling? I'll tell, I'll tell you an interesting story. I went to a Tony Robbins event like years ago in Hawaii. And I think these guys were onto it. And they said they ran a furniture shop and they had their own furniture shop. And they said times were, you know, it was going pretty tough for them. And they went to a Tony Robbins event and he, he was all about, you know, you got to make people feel good and all this type of stuff. And they said, all right, well, we're going to focus. We're going to focus on one thing when people come into the shop. Instead of trying to sell them anything, all we're going to try and do is if they come in at, let's say, a level five in terms of energy and fun and all that sort of stuff, we're just going to try and lift them up. We're going to make them feel better. Whether they buy furniture or not, we don't care. So we started doing this. People come into the shop, and our job was just to make them feel better. And they said our sales went through the roof, (laughs) right? And they said the only reason we're in Hawaii is because, I don't know, We did this and all of a sudden we started to sell things. So, you know, and you'll have to think about it for you, but for a lot of people selling, and and when I say selling, I use the broad sense of the word, it might be selling to your kids or selling to your partner or, you know, selling an idea to anyone, just, just an idea, is a lot of it can be, if you can make someone feel good, 
then probably what happens is you get rapport. And if you get rapport and them feeling good, then they're probably far more likely to buy into whatever it is you're saying or selling. And that, you know, if one thing, I want to make people feel good. So that that's a green zone because I can, well, technically speaking, so you could say, well, you can't control other people. Okay. But I can go into the, each selling situation with the intention of lifting Tony from where he is now to higher. And if I do that, if I go with the intention of making him feel good about himself every time, then chances are a lot of the time he will feel better about himself. And if he does feel better about himself, he'll feel good about me. And if he feels good about me and we've got rapport, chances are he'll probably be more, he'll probably want to buy from me. Yeah, 100%. So to, to bring it all together, I think the, the, the theme here is that uh, you know success, both in terms of uh, results, but also in terms of how you feel about life and your enjoyment, uh, and your energy levels is really about focusing on what you can control. So you can control the controllables, uh, which has the happy side effect of, you know, you take more action because you don't procrastinate and muck around. Uh, and when you do that and you consistently focus on the green zone, the funny thing is, is that your ability to influence things probably increases. Yes. Uh, rather than, uh, you know, in the sporting metaphor, if you're bowling, if you're worrying about what the score is and how many runs you're going to have off the over and whether the captain's going to give you another over at the end of that. If you focus on that, you probably bowl like rubbish. Uh, and, and, and a lot and, of cricketers, or a lot of cricketers talk about scoreboard pressure. Yeah. Which means they're looking at the scoreboard and they're feeling pressure because they can see that they're getting behind and they're feeling the pressure on the scoreboard resulting. Yeah. Same in business, isn't it? We focus on the, on the P&L or the lack of money in the bank account, which is actually, yeah. we can control that uh, or influence it, but we've got to go back to the bare basics of the things we can actually control, which is Excellent. which is green zone, which might, might be uh, actually I'm going to ring all the people who are overdue, and and you know make a phone call. That's something I can control. I can't control necessarily whether they're going to pay or not, but I can make the phone calls. That's it. And if I've done that, yeah. I've done my job. I've been successful for yep. the day. I've had most yep. of them tell me to piss off, but yep. it doesn't matter. I've done my job. I can feel happy. Yep. I've, you know, yeah. and the thing about green zone too, it's, it's so much simpler. Yeah. It's just simple. You know, you do have to yes. work out in advance. What are the high performance inputs? You do have to work for each of these situations, but once you know them, then your job is to go and do them and hold yourself accountable to doing them. And success becomes now how well you've done those inputs, not on the result that you've got from doing them. Yeah. See the Amazing. difference? Huge subtle but everything yeah, this yeah and ironically of... then, then you're as you said then the results often start to flow and then and then the danger is you you get seduced back into the orange zone because oh i've got it i've worked it all yeah. no, no, just do your yeah. job so team life and business throw up lots of curveballs and challenges but when you focus on the green zone you reduce stress you increase your effectiveness uh, in life and business and both of those things are just way more fun. Hey, I hope you liked the video. Check out all the other videos in the channel and like and subscribe.